Wasn't that a really neat experience to lead us into the message this morning? I hope that, uh, I'm just going to move this and move whoever's card this was, Krista's. Um, okay, we'll go like that. There we go. Well, I hope that that was a meaningful experience for you. And I hope that this whole series has been really meaningful for you in your own journey with Christ, that you've been asking yourself some questions about who you are in Christ and what truly defines you. I hope that as you wrote uh, your name, the name that God has given you, maybe not a literal name that you're going to go around calling yourself this thing, but that you'll um, begin through this series to define yourself, not through our own lens or through the lens of other people or how other people define us, how other people look at us, but that we would begin to be able to see ourselves as who God sees us to be. That this list that's in your program uh, would be sort of a cool accompaniment for you in your own journey as you're journaling maybe or as you're praying uh, daily and, and kind of trying to learn who you are in Christ that the, the truths of what's on those pages and in the scripture would come to life. I hope that God has used this series to give you a new name spiritually with him and that you're learning again not to be defined by what we do or by how other people see us, or by the size of our bank accounts, or by our job title, or by anything else other than who it is that God sees us to be. And that's, uh, that's the series we've been in, Identity Theft, learning not to look at ourselves from others' point of view, or, or just defining ourselves by our own insecurities and so on, but that we would begin to see ourselves, first of all, as adopted sons and daughters of God. That before God created the universe, that he had you and I in mind. That he thought of you before he created the world to adopt you into his own family. And secondly, that he's called you. Called you to be a holy person. Called you to be a set-apart person. Someone who lives for him and is used by him to do the things that he designed to do long ago. And thirdly, that you would see yourself as alive and coming alive in Christ. Where Christ would be resurrecting the dead parts of your spirit's in your souls in order to come alive in him. And then last week we looked at how in Christ we are God's masterpiece. Beautifully designed, beautifully created by a God who loves us and gave us a purpose to do the good things that he planned for us long ago. And this morning we're going to continue on with this series. We're going to continue on by looking through uh, the first couple chapters of the book of Ephesians as we've been doing all series long. And this morning's text, this morning's passage that we're going to look at is a little bit more lengthy than other weeks. And so I'm just going to read it for you up front here just to kind of get it out there for us. First of all, Ephesians 2 verses 11 to 16 says this, starting in verse 11 if you want to follow along. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when, in his own body on the cross, he tore down, broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Verse 15, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations and he made peace between Jew and Gentile by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Let's pray together. With Jesus, this morning... We pray that your words would come alive in us. That the words we just read would make sense in our spirits, not just in our heads, God, but that you would reveal yourself to us through your word this morning, through the Bible. Give me your words to say, God. Would, would you speak through me? Would you allow me to be sensitive to what your spirit is saying? Would you guide and lead me? And would you uh, help me to be sensitive to the needs of our people here, the people that are gathered the things that are going on in their lives. Whatever we brought into this room, God, whatever stuff we've got going on in our lives from this week, I pray that we'll be able to lay them down before you 
to know that we are not our past, but we are a new creation in you. You've given us a new name. You define us differently than we define ourselves, maybe. And this morning, as we look at another aspect of our identity, would that become very true and very real in our spirits this morning? It's in the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. Well, one of the things that our home churches have been up to in the last couple weeks is working through a curriculum that they'll be using even in years to come just to get started, to make sure that they're on the same page together as they launch things off in a new year. If you don't know what a home church is, by the way, a home church is a small group of maybe 8 to 10 or 12, sometimes more people that meet in homes throughout the week, and more more often than not, they debrief the sermon and talk about how it applies to their lives and, and so on. But one of the activities that the home churches did through this curriculum that they used to get started was they looked at a list of words that were on a page and had to choose a word that would best describe their current relationship with God. And on that list there were words like close and disconnected, searching, open, growing, loving, confused, stagnant, and dynamic, and so on. There was about 30 or 40 different words on that screen. It's an interesting exercise to do, to kind of have to pick a word that would describe where you're at in your current relationship with God. I think it would be worthwhile for all of us to do, whether or not you're in a home church or not, just to kind of take a time out and say, this is where I'm currently at in my relationship with God. It got me thinking, though, as I thought through this exercise, not just about what word I would choose for myself, what word I might choose to describe my relationship with God, and it got me thinking about the entire Bible, (laughs) the entire Christian message, the entire gospel, the thousands upon thousands of words in this book. If it were possible, maybe, to distill all those words, the entire Christian message, the entire gospel down to one word, What would that word be? If we could take the entire scriptures, the entire Christian message, and distill it down to one word, what would that word be? It's an interesting question, isn't it? To take the entire Christian message and try to sum it up in one word. It's really, in some ways, an impossible uh, question to answer. And yet, I think that there are a few words out there that we could use that would probably accurately, in some ways, describe sum up the entire Christian message in one word. One of those words is on the screen, as you see there. Love. I think that's a pretty good word to use. I mean, the Bible says that God is love, right? So if this entire message is about what God is like, well, that's a a good word. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. I mean, that, that pretty well, in a lot of ways, sums up The Christian message. Another word that people might use is the word grace. Last week when we looked at Ephesians 2, 10, for we are God's masterpiece. In verse 8, just before that, it said that we are saved by grace, not by works, so that none of us can boast. That it's through God's grace that we are saved. That's an excellent word to sum up the entire Christian message. Another word that we we might want to use is the word forgiveness. Right? That through the cross of Christ we can be forgiven uh, from our sins and we can be given new life and we can extend that forgiveness and that new, new life to others as well. I think that, that could be a good word. Or then there's this word that kind of seems to trump all other words. Once you drop this one, that's it. And that's the word Jesus. The name Jesus, right? The name Jesus could sum up the gospel. In fact, one of my favorite uh, uh, Christian jokes is about a Sunday school teacher who asked a class of young children, uh, what's small and gray or sometimes brown, eats nuts, climbs trees, and has a big bushy tail? And after a moment, one child uh, replies and says, I know the answer is probably supposed to be Jesus, but that sure sounds an awful lot like a squirrel to me. Um, <laughs> Right? We're in church, so Jesus should be the answer. And to some degree, in a lot of ways, that's true. That Jesus is the answer to a lot of the things that goes on in our life. And that the entire scriptures are actually all about Jesus. Jesus himself said that all of the scripture points to me, points to Jesus. That everything in the Bible ultimately points to Jesus. So Jesus would be a good word or a good name to use to summarize the entire scriptures. But that's not the word 
that came to mind for me as I was thinking about the word that I would use to describe and sum up the entire gospel. For me, if I were to sum up the entire Christian message, the entire Bible, the entire gospel in one word, if I wasn't going to use one of the words that we've looked at here on the screen, I would use a word that came out of the text that we looked at a little bit earlier just before I prayed. Let's look again at one of those verses. Ephesians 2 verse 16 where the Apostle Paul, the authors of, of Ephesians, says this. He says, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups, meaning people of all backgrounds, all ethnicities, all cultures, both groups, people who are at odds with each other, that Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility was put to death. That in Christ, we are reconciled to both God and to one another. That because of Jesus' death on the cross, we can experience spiritual and relational reconciliation. That would be my word for the gospel. Reconciliation or reconciled. That because of Jesus and what he's already accomplished for us on the cross, we can be made right with both God and with one another. Because that's what reconciliation is. Ultimately, it's about being made right. Being made in right relationship with others. In fact, the, the actual definition, according to Google, when you Google the word and ask for a definition, the definition Google spits out at you is this. It says, the restoration of friendly relations. Isn't that kind of a neat definition? The restoration of friendly relations relationships. That's what reconciliation, and that's what the gospel is all about, experiencing both spiritual and relational reconciliation. Spiritual reconciliation in our relationship with God, and relational reconciliation in our relationships with one another. That's what the gospel does, is it permeates our life with God and our life with, other, with others, making reconciliation possible. That in Christ, we are reconciled. That's what we're looking at this morning as part of our identity. We are his reconciled people. You and I, in Christ, are reconciled. The reality is, as you all know, is that we live in a broken world where reconciliation at times seems impossible, right? Whether we're talking about on a global scale where we're looking at war, and violence around the globe, and terrorism, and we're looking at organizations like ISIS, and that they exist, we realize that you know, reconciliation on that scale is pretty hard to consider a possibility. Or whether it be on a social scale, here even in Canada, where racism still exists, and sexism exists, and other isms exist, and there's homophobia, and Islamophobia, and fear of other people that just seems to divide us further from one another, where there seems at times to be anything but reconciliation, and wholeness, and restoration of relationship, just division. Or whether it be on an interpersonal scale, where... Uh, apparently, over half of today's marriages end in divorce. And a lot of them citing uh, irreconcilable differences. That's ultimately, a lot of the times, the reason why people file for divorce. Obviously, their stories are a lot more complex than that. But that's the reality of the world we live in, where divorce happens, and marriages fall apart, and friends backstab friends, and family members betray family members, often over money and things like this. And there are rifts between loved ones and family members that can go on for years and years and years. And at family gatherings, fights can break out. And, you know, next week's Thanksgiving, maybe you can't wait to have one of those fights with a, with a loved one. That's the reality that we live in in our world today, a broken world where reconciliation seems like a distant dream. The reality is, is that when we look at our world and we see war and violence and when we look across our country and across North America and we see the racism and we see the sexism and we see all the other isms and phobias and we look at our relationships and we see the brokenness, none of us want that. Like, nobody wants that brokenness in our lives. No one wants that kind of relational devastation on any level in our lives. That's not what we want. That's not what we were created to experience. And the reality is, is that the gospel, God's good news, is ultimately our only hope for real reconciliation. 
The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is our only hope for reconciliation with God and reconciliation with one another. Because deep down, as much as we want reconciliation with others, we want peace in the world, and we want wholeness, and all this sort of stuff, even more, I think, in our spirits, in our hearts, we want to know that we're right with God. That we've been reconciled to God. That he's not... He's not counting our sins against us, that he's not up in heaven angry and waiting to condemn us and judge us with harshness, but that he's a God of love who's on our side. We want to know that God. We want to be reconciled to that God. We want spiritual reconciliation and we want relational reconciliation. And so the question is for us this morning, what does it mean then to be reconciled? What does this look like in our lives? What does it uh, look like to have this as part of our identity, to be reconciled to Christ? How does this gospel of reconciliation make a difference in our lives? What does it mean to be reconciled? Well, I'm looking at our passage of scripture uh, this morning in Ephesians. There's two things I think that jump out to me. I've already kind of spoken about that a little bit. Two ways this gospel message of recon reconciliation makes a difference in our lives and shapes our lives. One is vertically in our relationship with God. And secondly, it's horizontally in our relationship with each other. That in Christ, we can be vertically reconciled and, and horizontally reconciled through Christ. Vertical reconciliation and horizontal reconciliation. Let's unpack that a little bit. First, starting with vertical reconciliation. Being reconciled to God, which in fact actually kind of um, it informs horizontal reconciliation as well. If we get this right, it changes everything. And so we're going to spend the most of our time this morning looking at vertical reconciliation, what that looks like for us. What does that look like for us? So in Ephesians 12, 11 and 16, the passage of scripture that we're looking at, first Paul talks about, he provides an answer to this question by saying, don't forget what your life looked like outside of Christ. That's what he says, verse 16, or sorry, verse 11. He says, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. Paul says, you want to know what vertical uh, uh, reconciliation looks like? First of all, let's think about what your life looked like outside of Christ. First of all, don't forget. Remember what it was like to be an outsider, to be excluded spiritually, to be unreconciled to God, vertically disconnected to God. He says, don't forget your past. Don't forget your story and where you came from and what your name was. Don't forget who you were outside of Christ. Remember what it was like to be an outsider spiritually. Don't forget your story. Remember what it was like to be an outsider. And what does he mean by outsider? He goes on in verse 12 and says this, in those days when you were a spiritual outsider, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. So what did it mean to be an outsider? It means a few things according to Paul. It means first of all you were disconnected from Christ, living apart from Jesus, vertically disconnected from God, that there was a chasm between you and God, a disconnection. You were living apart from God. Secondly, he says you were excluded from God's family, that you weren't part of the community that God had commissioned to be his people. And you lived in this world without God and without hope. You lived a hopeless, disconnected, excluded life. That's what our lives looked like outside of Christ as spiritual outsiders. Hopeless, excluded, spiritually disconnected from God, from our source of life. Outsiders in every sense of the word. And Paul says, don't forget. Remember what it felt like to be this person, remember your story. Remember where you came from. Remember what it was like to be a spiritual outsider before you came to know Christ. So why is this important? Why does Paul want us to remember our story and who we were outside of Christ? Well, I think there's two reasons why. In my experience, at least, there's at least two reasons why. First of all, when we remember our story, we become incredibly grateful for the incredible things that God has done in our lives. I mean, for me, sitting here and watching a number of you come forward and flip that sign and being able to see your story and enter into your lives, even just for that moment, I, I became so grateful 
for the ways that God had worked in your lives and the things that he had done in you to change you and make you a new person. When we remember who we were outside of Christ, what our life was like before Jesus, we become so grateful for the work that he's done to make us who we are today. We become so grateful to be called one of these names or any of the other names that we would have written down. It leads us to worship and to gratitude and thankfulness and, and to love, a deeper, deeper love for Jesus. That's the first thing. Secondly, when we remember our story and where we came from, we become a more inclusive people. We start caring for others more, others who are on the outside right now. We can't really fully appreciate our story and where we came from and then not care for other people who are currently still outsiders and are being excluded. The more, that we, the more that we understand the work that Jesus has done in us, the more inclusive of others, the more compassionate we become of others, the more welcoming we become of others, the more we reach out to others, we become. That's what the gospel does in us. makes us grateful and, and, and uh, so, so worship-filled for the work that Jesus has done in us and it causes us to live a life of inclusivity of others. That's the gospel at work in us. Because the reality is, is that we all start from the same place. You know, sometimes some of us have been Christians for so long that we forget what our name was. We forget what our story was before Christ. And in some cases, we almost become kind of arrogant. And we start thinking that we've earned this, or that because we're good people, or because we've done certain things, that, that we've deserved this, that we've earned salvation, or we've earned right standing before God. But the reality is that the Bible teaches is that no matter your story, and the things that you've done in your life, what your name maybe was, we all have the same spiritual starting place. In Romans 3.23, it says this, it says, For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Just a few verses before that, in verse 10, he says this, No one is righteous, not even one. All have turned away. You want to know that one thing that we all have in common, regardless of our story, regardless of what we've experienced, regardless of what other people have done to us or what we've done to other people, what we all have in common is that we all have the same spiritual starting place. We're all sinners, according to Scripture. We're all unrighteous in our own strength. We're all spiritual outsiders outside of Christ. And so all of us know what it's like to be an outsider, to be a spiritual outsider, to be on the outside looking in, excluded spiritually from the life that God created for us, vertically disconnected from him. And Paul says, don't forget what that felt like. Don't forget your story. Don't forget what your name was. Remember this. This doesn't define you anymore. This isn't who you are, but don't forget what it's like because it causes you to worship and be grateful for who God is and what he's done in you, and it causes you to be compassionate and inclusive towards others. Regardless of our stories, regardless of our past, we all have that same starting place that we are sinners, vertically disconnected from God. But thankfully, that's not all he says. In verse 13, he goes on and says this. He says, but now. I love that in, in Scripture. Anytime you see a, a but, B-U-T, in Scripture, or therefore, read what he says before that because he's saying this is the way things were, but now because of Jesus, this is the way things are. It's beautiful. But now. That's gone. That's old. You're not an outsider any longer. It says, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away, from God. But now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. I love that. But now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Jesus, through his death on the cross. We can be reconciled to God, made right with him, brought in, no longer on the outside looking in, but on the inside looking out, reaching out to others. That's vertical reconciliation. See, the reality is that God's heart was never uh, for us to be spiritually excluded. He never wanted us to be outsiders. He never wanted us to be vertically disconnected from God. That was never God's plan. And so he did everything he could do to change that. He brought us near to him through the blood of Christ, Paul says. Or in another place, he says this in Romans 5.8. He says, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. Listen to this. While we were still sinners, 
Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That while we lived as if God were our enemy, Christ came to earth and he died for us. If this doesn't blow our minds, a number of us have heard this many times before and it doesn't move, if this doesn't move us to gratitude and worship for what God has done for us, there's something off in our spirits. There's something off in our relationship with God that God wants to restore and heal. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't stand by passively and say, you know, oh well, I tried. I said to them, hey, you should say you're sorry and we'll be good. And he didn't just kind of inactively, passively just stand by and say, I'm, it's, they want to sin, they want to have life their way, then that's fine by me. They can do what they want. He didn't settle for that. Instead, even though he could have just shrugged his shoulders at us in our sin, his love for us ran so deep that even while we were his enemies, running away from him, spitting in his face, living for ourselves, lacking hope and direction. He came running after us. He pursued us with his love, no matter the cost, even if it meant his own life. He gave up everything so that we could be included, vertically reconciled to him. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This reminds me of a story. It's not a true story, but a parable of sorts that I once heard about an eccentric retired engineer named Mr. Johnson who lived on a small island named Thetis Island just off the coast of British Columbia. And Mr. Johnson had a passion and a real gift for restoring old cars. And it was a common occurrence to see him driving around in a beat up old sports car that he had fully restored to, to beauty after uh, he had finished with it. He had done everything, a whole bunch of different cars, a 57 Chevy and a 70 Lamborghini and a 1940s Ford truck, and he would restore them from top to bottom, keeping them and selling some of them just so he could do it over and over and over again. This was his passion. But then one day, he decided to try something different. Rather than restoring one car to its original state, he set out to build his own car, his own dream car. How he explained it was that there were so many things about some of the other cars he didn't like. He thought, I'm going to build the car that I like, the things the way that I think they should be, the things that I would have created them to be, that engine, this steering wheel, and so on, piecing it together, piece by peace. And he worked on it for years, ordering the parts from all over the world, from different cars that he liked and so on, in order to make this car perfect, exactly how he wanted it, because this was his baby. And in fact, he talked about his baby all the time. He got him on the topic of his car. He would ramble on and on and on about this part and this thing and that, and do you see this and do you see that? Now, there was a small uh, Bible school nearby on this island, a Cape and Ray, if you're familiar with Cape and Ray Bible School on this small island, of Thetis Island, and there was a young student named Evan who had gotten pretty close to Mr. Johnson over the past year as Evan studied at Thetis Island and Bible School there. And in fact, Mr. Johnson even hired Evan to come and help out around the property to take care of the grass and to stack wood and to help take care of the property and so on. And every time Evan would come to visit for a couple hours each week, he'd get there and he'd get the 20-minute update from Mr. Johnson on the car. You know, where Mr. Ev or Mr. Johnson would show him what he had done this week and this piece. Do you see that? Do you see this part? And so on. And every time Evan showed up, he'd mostly tune him out and just smile and nod and pretend to be interested. But deep down, he didn't really care. He was just not wanting to be rude to Mr. Johnson and his hobby. But finally, one day, towards the end of the school year, Evan arrived at the house to do his normal work around the property and found Mr. Johnson in the garage behind the wheel with the car fired up. His baby was done. It was built. And Mr. Johnson saw Evan and he looked over at him and yelled out the window. He said, get in. And in he did. Evan jumped in and off they went and drove around this small island, Thetis Island, seven miles worth of roads. And Mr. Johnson was just beaming as he was so excited to finally be able to drive his baby, his dream car, around that beautiful island. And as they drove around, 
Again, Mr. Johnson bragged and boasted about each part of the car. And did you know I put this kind of engine in and I put this sort of suspension in and I did this and see the clutch and on and on and on he went. And Evan just smiled and nodded. But then the most surprising thing came when they pulled back into Mr. Johnson's driveway and Mr. Johnson put the car in park, took the keys out and flipped them to Evan. And he said, your turn. And Evan thought Mr. Johnson couldn't be serious that he would actually let this irresponsible 20-year-old student actually take his baby, his dream car, for a spin. But that's exactly what Mr. Johnson meant. He said, I've been journeying with you over the past year. You've been listening to my stories about all the different parts. Take her for a drive. And so Evan fired up the car and on his own left Mr. Johnson's property to take the car, this dream car of Mr. Johnson's, for a spin. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, Mr. Johnson was working away on the property and was looking at his watch and wondering when Evan would come back. The, the island was not that big that he could have gotten lost, so it's strange that after 15, 20 minutes he wasn't back, but maybe he's having fun, that's okay. And then after another 15 or 20 minutes went by, Mr. Johnson started to get a little worried that maybe Evan had gotten lost or he got in some sort of accident or something had happened. And another 15 or 20 minutes went by and finally Mr. Johnson was actually now very worried, very concerned that something had happened to Evan and his baby, his car. And so Mr. Johnson got in his truck and started driving around the island trying to find Evan, but there was no sign of Evan or the car. He drove around for an hour, going around and around the same roads, trying to find him, going up and down the little trails and little hidden roads that he knew about, thinking maybe Evan took it off-roading. Oh no, <laughs> maybe he took it off-roading. Uh, but there's no sign of the car. And so Mr. Johnson got home and started calling Evan's cell. And Evan was not answering his cell phone, would not pick up, and he called over and over and over again. And finally, by that evening, after Mr. Johnson had looked everywhere and called several times, Mr. Johnson called the police, totally stunned, totally scared, not sure what was going on. All the worst case scenarios running through his head and reported to the police a missing person and a missing vehicle. Well, the next morning, on the line... He says to Evan, he says, are, are you okay? Or, like, where are you? What happened? What's going on? Tell me you're all right. And a simple, I'm fine, was all he got in response from Evan. Long story short, Evan went on to share that he was actually in Alberta with the car. That he had decided that he wanted to take the car for a real spin and got on the ferry. and Went back to British Columbia and drove through British Columbia and now was almost in Calgary. And that he wouldn't be returning the vehicle anytime soon. On this little spin, Evan liked the car so much that he thought he'd keep it. Well, Mr. Johnson had a whole bunch of different emotion going on. He was relieved that Evan was not dead. And yet, at the same time, he wanted to make him dead. <laughs> because his baby had been stolen. And he couldn't believe that Evan, the student, had stabbed him in the back like that. He just wanted Evan in the car back, safe and sound. So Mr. Johnson calmly asked Evan what it would take for him to just leave the car where it is. I'll pay anything. I'll do anything. Just don't hurt the car. Just leave it where it is and go. What do I need to do to get my baby back? That was what Evan wanted. He didn't really want to keep the car, and so he said, if you want your car back, your dream car back, it's going to cost you $20,000. $20,000. And he gave him the instructions on how to wire him the money through email and so on. And off Mr. Johnson went to the computer and fired off $20,000 to pay back, pay for his baby that he had already purchased and he had already built on his own to get his baby back. Twenty grand. See, here's the thing. And here's why I share that story. Because in God's eyes, you are that car. And I am that car. Now regardless of our dents and our scratches or even some of our missing parts, despite of our brokenness, God's love for us is so deep and so strong 
that he will do anything, and he has done everything he can to pay for our ransom, to get us back. He loves us so much. He created us just as Mr. Johnson created this car exactly how he wanted. He created us exactly how we should be, exactly how God wanted us to be, that we are his masterpiece. And he doesn't just leave his masterpieces out there on his own. He goes after them. He pursues them. He does everything he can to pay the ransom and get them back, to be reconciled to his kids, to be reconciled to his babies. That's God's heart for us. See, God refuses to leave us on the outside looking in, excluded from him. Including him was so important that he did the unthinkable. He went to the cross so that we could be bought back, so that we could be reconciled to him. He paid the ultimate price with his life because inclusion, his love for us was so important. That's who God is. You were that important to him. That no love is higher, no love is wider, is deeper, is stronger. Nothing can separate us from his passionate love. And he pursues us and will pursue you until the day that you die. Even if you ignore him, even if you reject him, even if you choose to walk in the other direction, God in his love will be Mr. Johnson and come after you until the day you die. He will never give up on you. That's his love for us. A never-ending, never-failing, deep and wide love. See, to be vertically reconciled to God is to be put in right relationship with this God who loves us so much that went to all lengths to make us right with him, to help have us experience his forgiveness and his love. To know that God has accepted us and embraced us despite our dents, despite our brokenness, despite the scratches on us, despite our sin. And he stops at nothing to make us vertically connected to him. And so my question for you this morning is, are you reconciled to that God? Are you connected vertically to God who, who loves you and has done everything he can to make it possible for us to be in relationship with him? Do you know that God? Does that story still move you in your spirit and in your heart? Because it should. If this doesn't move us, there's something dead in us that God needs to bring alive again. In Christ, we've been reconciled to God, vertically reconciled to him. That's the first thing that it means to be vertically or to be reconciled, to be restored in right relationship with God. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't just stop with us and God and that's it. It impacts our relationships as well. It impacts us horizontally. God came not just to restore us vertically to him, but to restore us and reconcile us to one another as well horizontally. And when we begin to experience what it is that God did for us on the cross, when this starts to make sense, it changes our relationships. It makes horizontal relation, or a reconcil re reconciliation possible. Ephesians 2.16 says this, we looked at this a couple times already this morning. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of death on the cross. And our hostility towards one another was put to death. That because of Jesus and his death on the cross, we are reconciled both to God and to one another. Even our enemies. Remembering that that's the love that God displayed for us. That even while we were sinners, even though we were his enemies, he came and he died for us. That's the kind of sacrificial love he has, that he would die for his enemies. See, when we get what Christ has done for us, how he's included us, how he's forgiven us, how he's accepted us, how he pursues us, we can't help but extend that same reconciliation to others. It changes our relationships. And there's two ways, two, two ways this plays out in our lives. Two ways that this um, horizontal reconciliation plays out. That when we understand that we're vertically connected with God, there's two ways it plays out in our lives. First of all, we become people who pursue reconciliation with others. We pursue reconciliation with other people. And secondly, we include other people. We pursue reconciliation and we include other people. First, what do I mean by a pursuer? Romans 12, 18 says this. 
If at all possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace in reconciliation with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. As much as it depends on you, do everything you can to be reconciled to other people. This means a couple different things. I know none of us love conflict. None of us love marital spats. None of us love getting stabbed in the back. None of us love having issue with friends or being betrayed or anything like this. But here's what this means, is that when we understand what God has done for us on the cross, that even while we were his enemies, he still died for us. We then in turn extend that same forgiveness and grace to even our enemies. Even the people who have hurt us the most. As much as it depends on you, live at peace with others. It means we don't avoid conflict. doesn't mean we initiate it either or pursue conflict. But when we find ourselves in conflict, we do everything we can do, as much as it depends on you, to make it right with that person, to be reconciled to that person. And secondly, it's not just in times of conflict. That's not the word that Paul uses here when he says live at peace. He's not talking about just conflict. What he's talking about when he uses the word peace is the word harmony. He says as much as it depends on you, live in harmony with everybody. What says, it's not just when things are hard or when there's conflict. What he's saying is we should be pursuing whole relationships with each other. Relationships that are reflective of God's relationship to us. Not broken relationships, but fully restored, where we love each other, where we include each other, where we accept each other despite our quirks and our scratches and our dents and so on. That's what it means. So that in our marriages, for example, when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 that God's love never fails, it never gives up, that's the kind of love that we have for our spouses. Never quits, never gives up. In our relationships with our coworkers, that coworker that just seems to always ugh, wanting to get the, the boss's attention, always kissing rear end, and ugh, that person. We love that person. We accept that person. We do everything we can to love our enemy. Enemy might be too strong of a word for a coworker who bugs us, but sometimes it feels that way. That's what this means. It means in our relationships with church people. Do you know that when people look at the church? Oftentimes, they think, I don't want to be a part of something like that. It's so dysfunctional. They're always fighting about the color of the carpet. Thankfully, we don't have carpet or even own a building to put carpet in at this point. They're always fighting about stupid things. Fighting over who wants this and who wants that. And they think, I don't want anything to do with that kind of church. And it's not just the silly things that we fight about. It's stuff that matters. But at the end of the day, we're called to be reconciled, to live at peace and harmony with one another. It doesn't mean that you always have to like everybody. It doesn't mean we need to be BFFs with everybody. It doesn't mean that we're called to love everybody. We are called to love everybody on the planet. Every single person that God puts in front of us. To, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. Now that said, there are times, Paul says, as much as it depends on you, there are times where it's not possible and you've done everything that you can, and the other person is not receptive to that reconciliation or that kind of relationship. And if that's, if that's where you're at, that's different. But that's an end-of-the-road conversation. That's a, that's a last-ditch thing to end relationships with people because we can't get along. In our hearts, we should do everything we can do to be reconciled to one another. That should be the norm for the people of God. The second thing... It means in our horizontal relationships, the way horizontal reconciliation plays out is that we become includers of other people in the way that we were once outsiders spiritually from God's plan, spiritual outsiders, and Jesus did everything that he could do to include us. We now live to be includers of people. Included people include people. That's what we do. In our churches, in our church context, that we wouldn't be a church of cliques where there's an in-crowd and an out-crowd, that does not exist. doesn't mean that you can't have a group of friends that you connect with and hang out and all that kind of stuff. But where we're less about the social hierarchical structures and who's cool and who's this and who's that, we become includers, where we actively pursue relationship with everybody. doesn't mean we need to be BFFs with everybody, but it means that we intentionally include everybody, where there is no 
up and down and who's in and who's out. It's just, we're the same. We're all sinners saved by grace and we love each other and accept each other. No cliques. Imagine a world with no cliques. Like, think about that. The insecurities that you feel in social environments because you don't fit into a certain clique. Or, imagine if God did away with that amongst us. The kind of cool things that God could do in us and through us. It means in our home churches where we debate about whether or not we should include someone else and we really like being together and we feel really close and intimate. And if we add a new person or if we uh, multiply to start a new group, we're going we're gonna to mess things up and we're going to lose our intimacy with one another. Here's the thing. Imagine you hadn't been included. Imagine no one had invited you to your home church. Invite, imagine no one else took a step out and said, we're going to start a new group so that we can make room for other people. Imagine a world where people just looked inward all the time instead of outward. Imagine a church. That church is a dying church. If we locked our doors every Sunday morning and said, okay, the members are here. All the insiders are here. We've got no room for the outsider. We would die eventually. Not necessarily physically. That would be messed up. If we all died in here together, people would think we're a cult. Some people already think that. <laughs> But spiritually, we would die. This church would cease to exist. It means when we're an includer, when we include other people, when we're in line at Starbucks or Tim Hortons, we don't just sit there on our phone and text and try to avoid making eye contact with people. It means that we are actively being cheerful and happy and being friendly to other people to include them. Wherever we go, I see M nodding. She does a great job at that. Every, every morning, our, our, our fearless uh, crossing guard here, making everybody feel included. That's what it means to be reconciled to God and to be reconciled to one another, is to be an includer of others. That's the gospel. And that's our identity in Christ, that we are reconciled to him. And when we get that, that we are reconciled to him, it changes all of our relationships, the way that we live out our relationships with each other. I want to close with this passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19. Sums it up nicely, I think. Where he says, all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And listen to this. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You want to know what it is to be a follower of Jesus? It's to live out this ministry of reconciliation. To see other people be reconciled to God. To know so deep in our heart, to be moved so deeply by this, by the cross, that we can't help but share that with others. And to be an includer and to pursue uh, reconciliation with ever, other, other people. That's what it is to be a reconciled person. And it's our ministry. He has committed to us this ministry of reconciliation that other people can know that God is not counting their sins against them. I want you to know this morning, wherever you're at in your faith journey, you're exploring, you've been a long time Christian, God is not counting his sin against you. He is for you. He loves you. He's on your side. He just wants you to be reconciled to him, to be in right relationship with him. That's his heart. He's done everything he can. Just as Mr. Johnson pursued that car, he's pursuing you even now. That's why you're sitting in this room. You're not here by accident. God has placed you here because he's pursuing you. He's coming after you. He loves you and he wants you to know that. For others of us who are in the irreconcilable, it seems, situations with people, spouses and coworkers and neighbors, and God has committed to you this ministry of reconciliation. What does that look like for you this week? To be made right with the people in your life and to let them know that God's not counting their sins against them and neither are you. Okay. I could keep going for a while. <laughs> Let's pray together this morning. Jesus, I pray that the lengths that you went to on the cross would move us in our spirits. That we would know how deep your love is for us, and not just for us, but for everybody. You've done everything you can to connect us to you. And in that, you've done everything you can to connect us and reconcile us to one another, God. You've given us this ministry of reconciliation. Would we 
take that seriously? Would we see that as your gospel, your gospel of reconciliation that you've invited us to participate in? In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, if you're newer around here, it's our custom each week to open the floor for Q&A. We've got a few minutes left to do that. I went long. We're all scared because it's quarter to 12 and we're thinking in our heads about lunch commitments and we know if we ask a question, this is going to... Going once. Twice. Sold to me, I guess. Uh, well, look, this morning, uh, the band's going to wrap things up in a, in a song. And I want to ask you a couple questions this morning, just as we wrap things up. Um, I know there are some of us this morning who have been exploring faith with us for some time, and that's, that's awesome. I just want to ask you the question, how do you know if you're right with God? If you've been reconciled to him? And if you're at all curious about taking next steps in that direction, I'd love to chat with you after the service. Um, I'd love to help you explore what it looks like to be connected to God in that way and to know the God who's pursuing you and loves you. Secondly, if you're someone who maybe has made that decision or knows that maybe you're right with God and hasn't been yet baptized, which is something I didn't talk about in this message, but baptism is really a signal or an image of reconciliation that we've been made right with God, that to go under the water signifies dying to yourself, to your sin. Coming out of that water signifies coming to life as a new person, being restored as the person that God has created you to be. If you've not yet been baptized as a believer, I'd love to connect with you as well about maybe taking some next steps in that direction and what that could look like for you to take a next step towards baptism. If you're in a place where relationally maybe your marriage is struggling and I talk about reconciliation with your spouse, don't do it alone. Like that's, we're in a community together so that we can journey through this stuff together. Come talk to me, talk to someone in your home church about stuff that's going on. That's often how reconciliation comes is through community and through people. If you're in a place where you're having problems, there's rec- an issue, conflict at work or with someone else, talk to that, about that with your home church. Let, don't do this alone. Let's be people of reconciliation together and pursue that sort of reconciliation together.